Okay, so we're back to Charmed content, and it's time to tackle the most prominent man in this female empowerment series, Leo Wyatt. Played by Brian Krause, a recurring guest star initially who got promoted to regular midway through season 2 and stayed that way for the remainder of the show. So how does Leo measure up to the other characters I've done lengthy videos on? Did he suffer from a lack of screen time like Daryl? Did the plot contrive ways to make him the villain like Cole? Did he get derailed and subsequently re-railed like Phoebe? Well, whoop like a bunch of trained simians and put on a good show, that's what you're here for. Leo is first introduced in Season 3's The Fourth Sister as a handyman Piper and Phoebe have hired to help look for their missing cat. Brian Krause had previously auditioned for Andy Trudeau and actually was working as a labourer when he was cast, also being so nervous before his first scene that he may have pretended it was April 20th. Although Piper and Phoebe playfully fight over him at first, it's obvious that he's a Piper love interest and the relationship is consummated quite quickly by episode 10, Wicker Envy, in which Leo is also revealed to have powers. BK panicked when he read this scene in the script, assuming he would turn out to be a warlock and get killed off. But Leo is good, actually, and he's a white lighter, there to be a guardian angel to the Charmed Ones, guiding and mentoring them, and healing any injuries to allow them to cut costs on makeup effects. Once his identity is revealed to the sisters, he and Piper fall in love properly, and despite Season 2 showing her conflicted between him and her mortal next-door neighbour Dan, she chooses him and he becomes a series regular for the rest of the run. This is how things spiral out of control! Now, I'm in a unique situation where my introduction to the series was Season 4 airing on weekdays and Season 1 on weekends, so I was essentially watching the introductions to both the Page and Prue errors at the same time. And since Season 2 is one of my least favourites, I rarely rewatch it in its entirety, meaning that my default for the Leo character is that he was a stable part of the Halliwell family and the guide and voice of reason there to ground the sisters, occasionally joining in the action himself but it's only when I go back and rewatch the entire series from start to finish that I realise Leo is kind of gross. I've been watching you ever since you were a baby. Uh-huh, yeah, see, that's too creepy to think about. I do want to acknowledge that this is first and foremost a problem with the show not working out its lore fully in the first two seasons, which happens on all shows that are experimenting and finding their feet. So obviously they didn't know what their white lighter lore was to begin with. Leo even saying to Phoebe that he's working for the Founders rather than the Elders we're more familiar with. But why in the world does Leo have to keep his identity a secret when he first shows up? What reasonable in-story justification is there for the sisters not to know he's a white lighter? Did anyone ever think that maybe he's a warlock? They might suspect him of being a warlock since they're new to magic, but that could easily be solved by orbing, healing an injury, or calling an elder down to explain the situation. You know what doesn't foster trust? Keeping your identity secret for no good reason. Why does it benefit the sisters to not know they're being guided and thinking they're on their own? You could maybe hand wave this if Leo was a new white lighter or inexperienced at dealing with charges like how they show Paige struggling in Season 7, but he was killed in World War II. That's basically 60 years to get good at this. And yes, there will be feet finding in the first couple of seasons while a show works out its mythology, but it's so weird how they just sidestep this. Maybe they didn't know what Leo's role would be when they created the character, which is probably definitely the reason, but considering they did know by the time of Wicker Envy, which is where it's revealed, what does that episode open with? Do you mind? No, are you kidding? I think it's great, as long as he's not still on the clock. I get that the intent is to flip things around where we think Piper is the one hiding things from Leo for dramatic irony, but she's got good in-story reasons to keep her secret from him. Why do they have this? Why is he specifically romancing her under false pretenses? <laughs> That was totally inappropriate, wasn't it? No, not at all. Yes, the truth spell revealed he had feelings for her, but why act on them while still keeping up the secret? Yes, he is called on this later, and yes, he does nearly die from Darklighter poison as a form of narrative karma, but I feel like this is letting him off too easily, since the tension of the story hinges on Piper being the one to forgive him, when he again hides useful information from her that is instantly forgiven and forgotten. When did you tell me? The love was the trigger. You had to find that out on your own. Bro, you really suck at this gig. The Charmed Ones made it to the end of the season in spite of you, not because. Okay, yeah, Wicker Envy will give you that. Hey, you don't suppose Leo was the... 
Season 2 makes him even worse as a character again, with the going behind Piper's back in the devil's music. Which, to be fair, the show calls him out on. Why didn't you just come to us? Because he knows I would have been pissed off. What are you doing? My job. And I suppose Piper is presented as perfectly justified in looking for another man who seems like he'd give her at least less of these headaches. But then we get to Awakened, which I know is a fan favourite episode, but I really don't like the contrivance of Leo somehow not being allowed to heal someone who protects the innocent every other day because the life-threatening virus isn't supernatural. And I also find Leo trying to loophole his way around it to be kind of wrong. Like, I know today's society loves glorifying trying to have it all or subverting traditional binaries of right and wrong, and this show got a lot of flack in the last decade for having such clearly defined parameters for good and evil, but to me, I stand by the principle of yes, this is against the rules, and if I do it, these are the consequences. Rather than going, screw it, the woman I love could die, I'm going to do what's right, and preparing to face the consequences, Leo tries to have it both ways, and waits until Piper is legally dead, and about to cross over into the afterlife before healing her in the hopes that the Elders don't find out. Did you get in trouble? Yeah, uh, actually. Lot. My headcanon is that the Elders don't necessarily clip his wings for breaking the rules, but more so for how irresponsible he was in trying to break them and get away with it. And then, once he's mortal, he says this. I'm gonna fight for you. Maybe the best man win. Bro, she's with someone else. She's happy with Dan. They have a stable relationship. She chose him because she decided she wanted something besides the stress you bring into her life. She sets down this boundary. I'm with Dan now. Although I think Dan is a pretty bland character, you do have to side with him in this situation. His girlfriend having her ex hanging around is one thing, some people genuinely are better as friends, but he repeatedly pushes and tries to undermine the relationship without a thought to what Piper actually wants. Leo just decides that he's the one Piper loves and keeps prodding until she admits it. And while Piper may have residual feelings for Leo, just having the feelings isn't an automatic green light. You let her come to that conclusion on her own terms. You know the stuff that Season 5 frames Cole as being so bad for doing to Phoebe? Leo basically does the same. Hoping Piper learns from her past mistakes. About the only silver lining is that Piper at least is as honest with Dan as she can be, but that's a check for her and not Leo, who breaks up a happy couple and gets exactly what he wanted. We get yet another secret from him in Ex Libris, where it's revealed that he was married in his previous life, and his excuse is... Because I didn't want you to get upset. Yeah, see, when I hear that, I just kinda think you didn't want to get an answer you didn't like. Say what you will about Cole, but at least he was upfront with Phoebe. Eventually. It sorta of makes you wonder if the Elders don't have a problem with the relationship not because it's White Light or Witch, but more like... Piper, sweetie, you don't want to waste time on this guy. Trust us, we've had to put up with him for 60 years. Season 3 begins a soft reboot of Leo's character, and that's one of many reasons it's tied with 4 as being the best. I don't want to die without ever having been married to you. The relationship had been just about tolerable because of the chemistry between Brian Krause and Holly Marie Combs, but the writing now finds a way to make it work. Dead is exactly what we're gonna be if they ever find out. He has to face some big consequences for again trying to loophole out of the Elder's decision by trying to marry Piper in secret, and he's only returned when Piper appeals to them in one of the more subtly strong moments for her character development. Damn it, I would have made a great wife. Even then, the couple is put on probation, with an outside party determining whether they are fit to stay together, which to be fair should be a thing for more couples in real life. They lean into the fact that Leo hasn't had a relationship since the 1940s and how the world has changed significantly since then, which is why I assume he went for the frosted tips. I've been a little harsh on Phoebe's hair choices, but the men can be held to task on that count too. Just you wait, Chris. But back on topic, this allows us to reframe Leo's actions in the previous seasons as quaint, greatest generation benevolent sexism. And now, he and Piper actually communicate about their issues without invalidating the other's feelings. And you know, the other stuff, we'll just… we'll figure out. We start to see more of the storylines from Leo's perspective, turning him from a satellite love interest and plot device to a character who has a say in things. We get to see him struggle with being a guide, and how being the one to take care of the most powerful good witches in existence means he sometimes doesn't know what he's doing. It's my guidance and support that got you into this mess. The episode Blinded by the White Lighter shows him coming into conflict with a more rule-abiding colleague Natalie, and actually considers the idea that he might not be the best White Lighter for them. But the story validates his methods by showing how his willingness to bend the rules makes him a good fit for the Charmed Ones. Or we were just winging it. Well, whatever you did, it worked. They make more of an effort to show it as a partnership, 
with Leo working in tandem with the sisters and treating each other with mutual respect. When the elders lift the probation, it feels pretty earned. We even see healthy couple moments between him and Piper, such as Leo automatically recognising that she's possessed when, to use her words, We're knowing the difference between my kisses and her. They get married in the middle of the season, and he spends the rest of it being an inoffensive supporting presence, occasionally getting to be part of the fun, like when he gets infected with sloth in San Francisco. So while I can't say I love the character at this point, Season 3 did begin a course correction that made him far more palatable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Season 4 doesn't just swap out proof a page and put Piper in the older sister role, it properly reboots Leo's character in a way that he's almost a different person from his early persona, in the best possible way. This is the season that emphasises his role as the mentor and voice of reason that the Charmed Ones need, especially with Prugon, and giving him a role that only he can fill in the narrative. In his marriage, he's shown to be far more of an equal to Piper, such as gently explaining why they can't cheat the system to bring Prue back, and calling her on the way she's been treating him and everyone else in Hell Hath No Fury. Piper, I'm your husband. Not just your white lighter. When you speak to me like that, there is a problem. This is actually one of my favourite Leo moments. Being understanding, but also not taking mistreatment. Having an argument without getting personal, which is more than we can say for Ross and Rachel. Oh no no, don't you worry about me falling asleep. I STILL HAVE YOUR LETTER! We also see more of him being a guide for Phoebe and Paige as well, making him feel like an important part of the family, and the show, rather than just an accessory to Piper's life. He also gets to do the occasional fun thing like sword fight in A Night to Remember, which gives us another cute couple moment. I find this side of very sexy. Really? Then for the first time in four seasons, unless you count Ex Libris, he actually gets a backstory episode. Leo, get over here, quick! I was surprised to find out that Saving Private Leo was such an unpopular episode because I kind of dig it. Not in my top 25, but I like what it does for Leo's character. We'd touched on what losing a charge meant to him in Blinded by the White Lighter, and it was honestly a missed opportunity to not see more of how losing Prue affected him too, but this allows Leo to be vulnerable for a change. They're getting even with me. They killed her because of me. Two of his former friends killing one of his charges to get revenge sends him into a depression that forces Paige to rise to the occasion and be there for him the way he was for her, allowing her to begin to grow into a white lighter in the making. And the flashback format allows his supposed good deeds that earned him his wings to not feel so… informed. It's also the first really good performance Brian Krause gives across the series. Nobody else is gonna die because of me. Season 5 continues Leo's improvement as a character, and not just by giving him his best haircut, now exploring the conflict caused by Piper's pregnancy, with the episode Siren Song having them switch powers unwillingly to force them to walk a mile in each other's shoes. For Leo, that means being pregnant for a day and learning exactly what Piper has to go through, with Piper in turn learning about what being a full-time white lighter is like. We also find out that Leo speaks whatever language his charges do, which gets my imagination going, picturing a bilingual charge trolling him by switching from English to Spanish. The emphasis is on equality between the couple, not putting either on a moral high ground, and them learning to come together. Season 5 is a divisive one in the fandom, but I think one of its good points is how Leo has finally come into his own as a character. Brian Krause is also far more comfortable in the role, and has some really nice comic timing. I was trying to go to the Elders to find out how to get rid of the Golden Geese, and why is there a unicorn in the kitchen? He's really a lot more comfortable playing the straight man in a comedic situation than he is the dreamy love interest in a melodrama. The episode Sense and Sensibility was written by him, so perhaps the man just has a natural affinity for comedy. Why do they call it morning sickness if it lasts all day? They also have some positive messages about gender roles that you still don't see in a lot of mainstream media, such as Leo taking paternity leave for Wyatt, since Piper has P3 to run as well as being a charmed one, and the show not making a big deal about the woman being the provider. There's also an interesting storyline in an episode involving dreams where Leo feels disconnected from the baby, and by contrast, his obsessing over becoming a father leaves Piper worried about their relationship changing from how it used to be. The way we used to be. And I don't want that to change just because we're married and having a baby. Cat House also touches on how he sometimes feels isolated with Piper having her sisters to turn to, which is something I wish they'd expanded on, and unpacked the very real issue of how men often don't have close friends like women do because of different socialisation. But he gets to be a big part of the season finale, where the Titans kill a lot of the Elders, meaning Leo has to step into a more active role that leads to him becoming an Elder himself. 
season five ends on a cliffhanger, with Chris, White Lighter from the future, being assigned to replace him looking after the Charmed Ones, but turning out to be of questionable morality by sending Leo away somewhere, revealed to be Valhalla from Norse mythology in season six. This sees Leo being taken in a more active direction, which does admittedly come at the expense of the characterization of the sisters in this year. What are we doing here? Leo is held captive and forced to fight the souls of deceased warriors to test whether they're worthy of Valhalla, which means he gets to do more of that sword fighting he demonstrated in season four, foreshadowing that he's a little more of a badass now. But once again, we see a return to uncomfortably familiar territory for him. And then your pain almost destroyed you. I wanted to help you, so you wouldn't have to deal with it all at once. So you took my feelings away? He casts a spell to take away the pain Piper is feeling over him leaving, which basically turns her into a Stepford wife. Although the spell is affected by him getting taken away, meaning he can't lessen it gradually like he planned to, it is again an example of Leo making decisions for Piper's supposed well-being without involving her. Except this time, the show actually calls him on it. Piper, don't stay away from me. While I don't agree with physical assault as karma, I kinda sorta think Leo did have this coming. I also feel like the season-long separation was motivated more by that than his becoming an elder. It obviously was affected by having to change whatever plans they may have had to accommodate Holly Marie Combs' pregnancy, but by the sounds of it, they actually didn't have that many plans. So Chris's motivation in separating them is one we can spend hours trying to make sense of. But once they're back on track, we get another reveal that informs a big part of Leo's character. In the future that Chris comes from, Piper dies when he's 14 and Leo isn't around. And while he gets a lot of criticism from fans for becoming an elder, it feels as though we're meant to criticise the decision. Learning about his future from Chris allows him new context on just what effect his becoming an elder would have on a literal child who has no concepts of the greater good and just wants to be held by his dad. Even more conflict arises when it's an elder who turns out to be the big bad of the season. You're the reason the future's threatened, Gideon. Not why. Leo's never before mentioned mentor Gideon, who will be responsible for Wyatt turning evil in the future via good old self-fulfilling prophecy. And while this broken pedestal has less power with how late in the game Gideon shows up, I have nothing but praise for what happens in the season 6 finale. Chris. Hey. Hey. I saw this episode described as borderline Leo torture, which I agree, and I love it. All Hell Breaks Loose was Prue torture, Morality Bites was Phoebe torture, you get the message. Chris! Leo having to watch Chris die right after mending the rift with him, knowing it was at his mentor's hands, having to see his son be kidnapped by said mentor, and being tormented by Barbus with visions of what Wyatt might turn out to be? And I swear to you that when I was first taking clips from this scene for my series wide video, I had to stop in the middle of the edit because Brian Krause's pain scream here really got me. <coughs> this dude was acting. To do what? A great evil. And the episode brings Leo to very interesting places, where he can't be the pacifist healer anymore and has to commit a great evil not just to save Wyatt, but to restore the balance between the two worlds. And the great evil is not just him killing Gideon, it's giving him a long, drawn-out death that is quite clearly torture. I'm on board with this because it's not really robbing a character of their purity. Leo was never pure. Rewind to the beginning of this video if you want his list of sins. I see it more as him finally having to get his hands dirty. But then we move on to season 7. When you kill, you feel nothing! This rather sadly takes away the ray of hope ending to season 6 and shows that Leo is still not in a good place. He's become a hardened vigilante, desperately trying to kill Barbus, and is so consumed with wanting revenge that he can't tell friend from foe anymore, even killing another elder by accident. Some people aren't wild about Leo's edgy era, but I'm on board with it. You demons have it so easy. Firstly, because it examines what happens when a character who was previously a pacifist has to live with themselves when they're forced to commit a great evil for the greater good. And second, because the subsequent Avatar storyline is Leo trying to escape this new persona. There is, however, another way. 
a better way. He wants the world to become a utopia because he can't unsee what Gideon tried to do or the sight of Chris dying in his arms, and he wants to be able to sleep at night knowing his children are safe. But as Piper learned when casting her fearless spell, you can't resort to a quick fix and it's all about doing the work yourself. See that what the Avatar is doing is wrong. He's the one to realise the price that comes with Utopia, and that it's not a world where his children are safe, just one where they're safe if they're kept in line. And in some ironic symmetry of what Gideon did with Barbus, Leo has to work with a demon for the greater good, although it's not him who stops the Avatars. He just makes a sacrifice so that the Charmed Ones can do it properly. Put the world back. And you could argue that this allows things to be in their proper place once again, where Leo isn't a solo act. He's there to support the Charmed Ones, who for all their flaws have proved to have more temperance than him, which is why they're fighting demons and he's the healer. But this then segues into Leo's next bit of character development, where he obviously can't just go back to being a white lighter and elder after everything, especially since they actually tried to kill him before Utopia. He's given a final test of character, where he gets his memories wiped so they can see whether he'll default to choosing Piper and his family, or being a white lighter. I don't think there was any doubt which option he'd go for, but it's a good enough story and a significant improvement over how Season 2 handled it. And it's a pretty positive statement about gender roles, all things considered, to have the father be the one to give up his livelihood for his family, and there to be zero fuss about it. All that matters is they were together again. And instead of just having Leo be kind of there for the remainder of the season, they have him take over teaching at magic school so that Paige can focus on being a full-time white lighter. But of course, at the end of the season, Leo may be left out of the final battle with Zanku, and not even told the sisters' death-faking plans. Now there's a switch around. But he goes into hiding with them too. I can live with that. I'm glad something Wicker This Way Goes wasn't the true finale, because this boy kind of got shafted in an otherwise great episode. But now for the real last season. Voila. New identities. Leo is only in 12 episodes of season 8 thanks to those significant budget cuts, with Holly Marie Combs recently stating that one of the toughest decisions she ever made as a producer on the show was telling Brian Krause he would have to be axed for 10 episodes. As a result, Leo has no storyline for the first half of season 8, acting again as that support role and being the one to mind the children while the sisters are off demon fighting, or else having couple issues with Piper that are actually quite refreshing to see portrayed. Since in TV land, the second there's conflict between a couple, it's a sign they're headed for a breakup, as opposed to working on the issues and resolving things like you're supposed to do in real life. And that's what happens in The Lost Picture Show, where Brian Krause gets to do a spot on Holly Marie Combs' impression for the Freaky Friday portions. People who know what they're doing don't cause explosions. But he does get some interesting spotlight in episodes like Desperate House Witches. Wow, I said that title with a straight face. Where he pretends to be a demon to try and rescue Wyatt from a resurrected source. Or else Battle of the Hexes, which I think is a far better parable about gender equality than it's given credit for, where he's turned invisible to help save Billy from Hippolyta's belt. Fuck. But in Via Con Leos, the big twist is that the Angel of Death sees Leo's name on his list and warns Piper about it, with the plot being about trying to find a way to change the circumstances before ultimately freezing him in time until the final battle is over. I have to lose you to save you. Honestly, I kinda dig this plot twist. As much as I appreciate what Season 8 examines when Leo is there, he is just sort of there by that point, so it kinda sorta makes sense to write him out. I gave up being a white lighter and, and an elder so I can live again. It makes for a nice bit of tragic conflict, where he gave up being a white lighter for good to be there for his family, and just when he settled into things, he's told it's clogs popping time very soon. And it comes right as he and Piper have resolved a lot of their recurring issues. This is the only way. The only way. While this choice was more budget motivated, it does show how well the Charmed writers could roll with these curveballs and incorporate them into the storylines in a way that worked. It centres him not just as a satellite love interest, but an important figure in the story who Piper now has to fight for, adding even more urgency to the eventual reveal that Billy is the ultimate power, and facilitating the wedge between her and the Halliwells. Since Piper is motivated by the want to get Leo back, and knowing she can if she vanquishes the ultimate power, but that's going to be hard because the ultimate power is a human that she spent the last year mentoring. Even when he's not there, Leo's absence is allowing for all this conflict to build and escalate to the finale. Like when Spartacus wrote Navia out for the last episode of Blood and Sand, and had her MIA for three episodes of Vengeance. The characters' absences hang over the story and increase the urgency of finding them so things can be resolved. And it's kind of brilliant that Leo's return comes at the end of Kill Billy Volume 2, 
the first part of the finale, when Phoebe and Paige have been killed in a battle with the ultimate power, so Piper gets what she wants, but at a price. The battle is over, though not as I expected. And Forever Charmed then has Leo and Piper working in tandem to fix things, with the added tension that preventing the deaths of Phoebe and Paige will result in the Angel of Destiny taking him away again. And then once Christy is barbecued, Leo gets returned to Piper and they all live happily ever after, with confirmation that they live to a ripe old age and the house is full of grandchildren. So, was there a Leo problem after all? Well, yes, absolutely at first. Seasons 1 and 2 Leo are kind of awful and there's plenty of yikes to go around. On my most cynical days, I start wondering if maybe Dan was actually the better option in the love triangle, but really Piper did not have much to work with. If only Mark wasn't dead. Actually, the ghost was the best of the bunch. But showing how in its first four seasons, Charmed did get stronger as it went along, seasons three and four solved the problem considerably, as well as Brian Krause becoming more comfortable in the role. These are my demons, not yours! I can't say he was my favourite character, but he felt like an important part of the show at least. And dare I say, even one of the strongest things in my least favourite season. I was under the impression that he was a universally popular character until recently, when I found out how divisive he was, and I'm sort of like, yeah, I see it. For me, most of the Leo problems were fixed by season 4, and they took the character in interesting directions by seasons 6 and 7, but I can fully get that he's not everyone's cup of tea. Like, even though I think they improved him as they went on, I didn't exactly miss his presence in those 10 episodes of season 8. But I did feel something when he was returned to Piper in the finale. I guess I'm taking the coward's way out and saying that it's a mixed bag. I have this really strange feeling that I did something I should apologize for. Perhaps I'll never truly make up my mind on the character. I am reconsidering my dislike of Miss Prudence, and tried my hardest to get people to reconsider theirs of Miss Jenkins, so perhaps all of you can tell me what I should be thinking about Mr. Wyatt. Was there a Leo problem? And if so, was it fixed, or did it get worse? I'm really drawing a blank here. But whatever conclusion I come to, if I do, we can't deny that he was the only character after Piper and Phoebe to stay on the show for the whole eight seasons. That has to count for something, and I'd say that it does in the eyes of a lot of fans. And perhaps we can include me in that, after all.